This brief recording will be examining the common endocrine disorders that involve the posterior pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary gland, also known as the neurohypothesis, produces antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. And diabetes insipidus and the syndrome of inappropriate ADH are two complications that can occur if there's not enough or too much of this um, antidiuretic hormone produced. I often say that the study of endocrine disorders can be looked at as a study of opposites. And this is very true with diabetes insipidus and syndrome of inappropriate ADH, whereas um, diabetes insipidus is under secretion of ADH and SIADH is over secretion. So keep that in mind as we progress through this portion of the learning plan. Another thing I'd like you to keep in mind is diabetes insipidus really has nothing to do with blood sugar, so don't let that word diabetes confuse you um, di with diabetes mellitus, that is. Mellitus actually means sweet, and insipidus means tasteless, and I guess there was a point in time where lab technicians would actually have to taste the urine, determine if... Um, there was sugar in the urine because when the people would have polyuria, this was one of the diagnostic tests. If there was sugar in it, then it was diabetes mellitus. And of course, if it wasn't, then it was tasteless or insipidus. So what is diabetes ins insipidus? Well, basically, antidiuretic hormone is needed to make the distal tubules and the collecting ducts of the kidney permeable to water in order for... Um, water to be reabsorbed or fluid to be reabsorbed. So with the diabetes insipidus, there is just not enough ADH produced or the um, tissue is not sensitive to it. So the result is that instead of water being absorbed as needed through the kidneys, water is being excreted and in a large amount. So even though diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with blood sugars, you will see some common um, symptoms with diabetes mellitus. For instance, there will be polyuria because there is no ADH or vasopressin to keep the um, fluid in the body. So the person will be producing a lot of urine. Um, hence, they will become dehydrated. And their um, serum osmolarity or the osmolarity of their blood will become increased because there's not enough um, solution for all the solute or all the components of the blood. And because of that, the thirst is, um, center is stimulated and the client will experience thirst. And they'll drink a lot, which is polydipsia. And um, then that, of course, just adds to the polyuria. So even though there's not a sugar issue here, you will see the polydipsia, um, polyuria. However, um, there's no polyphagia, like the three Ps with diabetes mellitus, and the blood sugar is unrelated. There are four major reasons um, that one could experience diabetes insipidus. The first is nephrogenic in nature. In other words, the kidneys just don't respond to the antidiuretic hormone. Usually this type of diabetes insipidus is inherited. Um, the second is drug-induced diabetes insipidus. Lithium is a real common culprit. About 10% of those individuals taking lithium um, as a mood stabilizer will experience diabetes insipidus. So definitely um, have to be assessing for that with these clients. Um, there's also an antibiotic called demeclocycline, which is a tetracycline. It interferes with the antidiuretic hormone response in the kidneys, so that can also cause a diabetes insipidus. Okay, two other reasons or two other potential causes of um, diabetes insipidus. The first one is primary, where there's an actual defect in the hypothalamus or pituitary gland, in particular, of course, the posterior pituitary gland. So there's no release of or a diminished release of antidiuretic hormone. The second one is secondary, and it results from a tumor or metastasis of other cancers um, in the area of the pituitary. Also, head trauma, infection, or the removal of the pituitary, perhaps as a treatment of hyperpituitarism or a removal of a tumor. Um, as you know, it's called a hypophysectomy. So anybody with any of this history will... Or 
is at risk for developing um, diabetes insipidus. So what will diabetes insipidus look like? Well, common manifestations are those that really correlate with dehydration because remember, they're not able to keep the fluid in. So you will see a rapid heart rate simply because the stroke volume is diminished. So in order to compensate, the body will increase the heart rate, um, low blood pressure, again, because of the dehydration. They um, most likely would exhibit a low-grade temperature. The skin would be dry with poor turgor. And as I talked about before, hemoconcentration or increased serum osmolarity. Another thing you will see in the urine, it will be decreased urine osmolarity. So make sure you're clear on that. Um, so the urine will um, be very dilute, okay, but the blood will be very concentrated. All right, so how is diabetes insipidus diagnosed? Well, generally, they'll do a 24-hour INO and allow the client to have restricted intake. And then if the output is greater than 4 liters over 24 hours, diabetes insipidus is unexpected. They could do with some other urine tests. It's, um, they could test osmolarity, and as I said, the osmolarity will be very low. Also, the specific gravity will be very low. Some common nursing diagnoses that would be applicable for this client are deficient fluid volume related to polyuria, um, decreased cardiac output related to dehydration, um, impaired oral mucous membranes related to dehydration. And if you think about it, this client, we just think one minute about um, fluid and electrolytes, they're urinating a lot and they will be at risk for hypokalemia or low potassium. Therefore, there is a potential for dysrhythmias. Also, um, not included on this slide, would be they would be at risk for sodium imbalance. And if you think about it, they're going to have a lot of solute and very little solution in their vascular space. That way they could be concentrated and they could have hypernatremia greater than 145. Um, as far as medical interventions, they could treat it with some medication that have, has been found to actually increase the action of existing antidiuretic hormone. So this would be appropriate for a person who is secreting some antidiuretic hormone. Um, Diabenes and novopropamide have um, been found to work in that capacity, even though with either one of these medications that wasn't their original intent or their original action, but it was found to do just that. Also, they can replace the antidiuretic hormone with a synthetic replacement. Um, desmopressin acetate is the most common replacement. Uh, the route for that is oral, IV, um, or nasal spray. And the frequency and the amount of the dosage depends upon the client's symptoms. And basically, this works by eliminating the amount of water that is eliminated in the urine. So what are some nursing interventions? Um, obviously, preventing and treating the dehydration is a priority. Um, you need to know how to assess for dehydration. Again, vital signs, um, skin, mucous membranes, hair, nails eventually. Um, you know, make sure you're monitoring INO very carefully. Make sure that intake equals output, that the output isn't um, getting larger. And if it is, you want to report that. Um, and then daily weight, you know, of course, ideally in the same scale and the same time of the day. Teach a client signs and symptoms of diabetes insipidus when to report it, um, that it could be getting first, worse. For instance, if they experience rapid heart rate or any kind of palpitations or dizziness, which would indicate decreased blood pressure. Um, if they develop a low-grade temperature. Um, if there's any kind of change in personalities, which could be associated with the sodium level, you know, have make sure the family knows to report that. Uh, and, and if they're being treated with hormone replacement with desmopressin, then they should also be educated about signs and symptoms of fluid volume overload in case they begin to retain too much. And that brings us to the next topic, the opposite of diabetes insipidus, which, of course, is SIADH. So what is 
syndrome of inappropriate ADH. That is when there is just too much vasopressin or too much antidiuretic hormone. I know some people remember um, how to differentiate this from diabetes insipidus is that SIADH is kind of a long acronym which stands for or could represent retaining too much water or too much vasopressin. Um, normally in our bodies when our serum osmolarity is low the antidiuretic hormone production is slowed down and the release of it is ceased. However, in people with SIADH, um, this vasopressin or ADH is secreted even when plasma osmolarity is low. So water is retained and fluid volume overload with hyponatremia will result. So who is at risk for developing SIADH? Um, individuals who have experienced head trauma, who've had a stroke, or, or have existing cerebral vascular disease, or even something like meningitis, encephalitis, um, could be at risk for this. Um, patients who have TB or pulmonary disease, and, and even some with cancer are at risk for developing this. In fact, um, patients with lung cancer comprise about 75% of the clientele that, with cancer that get SIADH. So sometimes, actually, people who have lung cancer may present with um, fluid volume overload or the signs and symptoms of SIADH and then later discover they have a mass on their lungs. Um, some drugs have, um, have caused uh, excessive antidiuretic hormone production or have caused SIADH, and the first one would be the use of the antidiuretic hormone for treating diabetes insipidus. Um, some antineoplastics, and Christine in particular, can cause this, and some antidepressants. So the signs and symptoms that you would um, expect to see are consistent with fluid volume overload and hyponatremia. So if you recall what those are, um, you know, you'd see increased blood pressure, probably weight gain. Um, you could see the heart rate going up, possibly trouble breathing. Um, obviously with hyponatremia, it could have neurological changes. Um, generally, you don't see a lot of dependent edema in these patients. Um, it's because of, um, related to the retention of free water and, and not the retention of sodium. Um, again, watch for confusion, lethargy, hostility, anything that could indicate a sodium um, level that is decreasing lower than 135. However, serious CNS effects could um, manifest themselves under, say, like 115. So um, hopefully we can catch it before that. As far as um, diagnoses, it's, um, they'll just draw an ADH level and see what's going on there. Um, the blood osmolarity or serum osmolarity will be decreased. Sodium, of course, will be decreased. And what about urine osmolarity? Do you think that'll be increased or decreased? It would be increased because the urine is concentrated. Specific gravity would be elevated. So that, too, could be examined. Um, as far as some nursing diagnoses that would apply for a patient with SIADH, the first one I noted here was safety, simply because the sodium level in these people can um, skyrocket pretty quickly and even progress to seizures and coma. So um, I listed safety first. Fluid volume overload from retaining so much um, fluid, of course, impaired mucous membranes, thirst, uh, Thirst, especially if they are placed on a fluid restriction for their hyponatremia and knowledge deficit. So as far as intervening for a client with SIADH, the medical focus is really on eliminating some of the water while replacing sodium. So that would include a fluid restriction. Sometimes fluid restrictions can be very low at first, even as low as 500 mils per day. And of course, this implies that the nursing staff would really keep very strict INO and monitor um, the, the patient, not only educate the patient, but educate the CNA, CNAs or support staff. As far as nursing, other than, um, of course, very strict INO and monitoring the fluid restriction, safety because of the hyponatremia, 
want to continue to assess for fluid volume overload, you know, listen to the lungs, take the vitals, um, et cetera. If the client is um, receiving tube feedings or any medications that need to be mixed, uh, it's a good idea to use saline um, solution instead of water. Sometimes pharmacy will be involved in this um, aspect as well. Thirst management, helping the client get through their um, fluid restriction, like I said, it could start off very low and then increase as um, the INO starts to balance out a little bit more. Um, and then teaching about signs and symptoms and as far as going home, how to tell if the SIADH is recurring, getting worse, etc. Um, prognosis of SIADH is really dependent upon the cause of it and um, so it varies from case to case. So that is the presentation on comparing diabetes insipidus with syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, both related to um, the vasopressin or ADH that's released from the posterior pituitary gland. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.